we're going to take a bit of an infrastructure tour. Okay, we'll start here in Ithaca. You are here. This is Bradfield, the monstrous building that we're actually in right now. Um, and again, just very briefly, we're going to be touring to understand some uh, broad issues in infrastructure. Just kind of give you a sense of the scope that things are going to be that things are going to be covered in the class, uh, and to hopefully start to get into some of the complexities in terms of how different pieces of infrastructure interact with each other and how that can get into, you can get into policy issues quite quickly and, and things like that. Uh, and again, I know we have lots of backgrounds. So some people, maybe particularly some of those civil and environmental engineering types will probably know a bunch of this stuff. Uh, and and long-term Ithaca residents might also know some of these things, but uh, hopefully there'll be something in here that, that everybody doesn't know. Okay, well, let's start with a question. Uh, if I go out there and I drink out of a drinking fountain, which I don't recommend because it doesn't taste very good, um, does, where does that water come from? Fall Creek. It comes from Fall Creek. Right. So, here we go. Cornell has its own water treatment plant, okay? And it's not too far from here. It's right here on campus. You can see Fall Creek coming by. These are the plantations. If you haven't been out there, you should definitely go more in the summertime. Um, but they're nice in the winter too. Uh, so Cornell has its own water supply, water treatment plant. Uh, the Cornell water treatment plant gets its water from Fall Creek. Fall Creek originates in Lake Como, which is a bit northwest of Cortland. If that gives you any sense, we'll, we'll look at it at that a little bit later. Um, and the, the entire watershed that it, that composes Fall Creek is about 125 square miles. So not too big, not too small. Um, again, just gives you kind of a broad sense of where Cornell's water comes from. Uh, it comes from sort of the, the surrounding landscape. Uh, this particular treatment facility serves about 31,000 people. You can think of you know, the number of people who actually work at Cornell or go to school at Cornell. It, it takes about one and a half million gallons per day out of Fall Creek. And according to their website, the rates that they charge to different Cornell connections are about $6 per 1,000 gallons of water. Uh, and you, just to put that into some perspective, that's about a, a shower a day for two months. So you could pay $6 and get a shower a day for two months with the water that Cornell takes out of Fall Creek. Um, it depends on how long your shower is. So, uh, I, I didn't want to get into the engineering too much, but everybody does have this little bit, very basic simplified schematic. And one of the one of the goal one of the things I wanted to sort of illustrate here were some of the similarities and differences between the different types of water treatment. And you know, some of these things may strike you guys as very complicated, and I, I suspect that some of them may strike you as actually very simplistic, actually as well. Um, some of the different pieces of, of water treatment when we get into engineering engineered systems. Uh, so if we're looking on the, at the top pathway, we're talking about basic water treatment. There's a lot of alternatives here. This doesn't cover everything. Um, but you can see, for example, at the left, you have a stream or an aquifer. It comes into the treatment plant. I wish I had pictures, but I don't. Um, maybe this summer we'll get some. It comes into the plant. It gets, now I have a little, little sign here for essentially screens. So you can just think of water running through big screens, and that takes out you know, uh, plastic bags maybe, or large objects, which I'll just leave that to your imagination. Um, you know, really large rocks, hopefully fish, things like that. Um, and so then we move on to this sort of rectangle thing. Um, with the arrow coming down, you can see, so what we, you, what we normally do is, not necessarily immediately, but pretty soon we add chemicals. So we'll probably add uh, a coagulant of some kind. Um, and then it'll go into this first rectangle here, which is probably a, some sort of coagulation basin. Um, they're not always separate, but what we're essentially trying to do is, if you imagine the main problem with water when we're looking to looking to drink it, not always, but one of the main problems is just sediments in there, so solids. If you think of a glass of water, if you had a really big solid, like a pebble or a stone, and you just dropped it in, it would fall right out. Well, that's what we want. The only problem is that most stuff that's in the water is not that large, and it won't just drop right to the bottom. So you have to do something to essentially make it heavier. So we add some chemicals in there. It makes the solids heavier. And then when you get off, when you get into this triangle thing, essentially what happens is all the stuff that's heavy falls to the bottom, and we can take, and we can remove that portion of, of the waste. 
Um, and that's what's known as sludge or solids. It really depends. Uh, and the next step here, where the, the arrow comes in from the top, uh, I, I left these. I left the the labels off in case you wanted to like follow along and put your own labels on. Um, that's most likely some some sort of disinfection process. Uh, you can think chlorine is the easiest thing to sort of imagine. Um, some sort of chlorine product that they would add to the water. Um, and again, there's all sorts of options here. You might have you may filter the water through something like sand. Uh, you may you may use essentially a really large Brita filter. Um, we might have activated carbon and some sorption and things like that. So anyway, that was the quick quick overview of water treatment. Does anybody have any questions on that, or want me to explain something more? Right, who, where are the symbols from? That's the test I'm kind of learning. So where you get? Obviously, you have some symbology here. Is that just engineering jargon? Uh, I think. Does that, does that make sense? Do they make sense to you? Yeah, they yeah. do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just like a little mixer. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, they look like that, but, you right. know, I don't know. Okay. So I, that's actually, it's a good point that you, it's good that you asked that question, because I think what's going to happen for a lot of these lectures is, you know, for example, I just used some symbology that, to me, is pretty, it's not, I would say it's obvious, but, like, it made, it made, it was pretty clear to me that that's what I should put down. But if you're not from that discipline, like you have no idea what you're looking at. Like the screens um, are one thing. Another thing that I, on some of my other schematics, I don't know if I include it on one of them, but for example, I'll, you might see a sign like this, you know, and you're looking at, you might look at that and you're like, uh, okay, compass? Like, I don't know, but it, it means a pump. But unless you're an engineer, you, you don't know that that means pump. So I suspect we're going to continue to run into those types of issues, um, which is good because learning about them is what we want to do. All right. <coughs> okay. So once we've treated some water, what do you think Cornell does with it? Oh, you can look on the thing here. Okay, I, I, I give it away. Um, they store it, not for very long, um, but they do have a storage tank. And if you've ever seen, for example, this white storage tank, which is elevated and sort of above ground, up by the plantations. That's what they don't use. That's old. Um, they're going to tear it down next year. What you don't really see, unless you're looking at it from above, is this large, partially subterranean storage tank, which they do actually use. It's much larger and has some more connections that the old one didn't have. Um, so the water goes there. Uh, why would you put it up here at the top of the plantation? Exactly. So it's at, it's at essentially the top of the landscape, the highest point in the landscape. So once you get the water there, it should just fall to everywhere else by gravity. You don't need to add energy to get it places. So that's that's why it's there. Um, now, why would you want to store water? I mean, essentially, like if, if the if the stream is running low in in August, let's say. And you know Cornell still needs lots of water, which we always do. Um, it's nice to have a little bit of a backup, so you have a, a bit of a storage, um, a bit of a storage capability in, in case the immediate demand outstrips the immediate supply. On the flip side, you wouldn't want to store the water there too long because when you have standing water, you obviously get sort of the classic issue with you might get pathogens developing or bacteria forming, things like that. So. There's a bit of a balance there. Uh, also, just if you look on the Cornell Water, Tre water Treatment Plant website, they have 36 miles of water mains. That's the pipes that go below, below the different streets on campus and things like that. And they get 8 to 10 main breaks a year, which I understand is about average. It's about average for the, for the US. OK, average for the US. So 8 to 10 times a year, one of their large pipes breaks or we'll say malfunctions in some way, they probably got to get out. Likely they have to dig up the street, get down there, and, and fix it. So it, and that's very expensive. <laughs> OK. So we'll move on. Where does your water go? So right, once the, the water that you didn't drink on the drinking fountain, it goes down the drain, OK? It's going to make its way down here. 
Ithaca wastewater treatment plant. Okay, you can see this is Cayuga Lake up here. Um, this is the farmer's market, right? <laughs> so if you've ever tried to get in there on a Saturday or Sunday during the summertime, okay, you're parking around here, and maybe you didn't know that this large plant was sitting right next to you. This is Aldi, okay? This is the pond. You get the idea. All right. So a couple of quick facts about waste, Ithaca wastewater treatment plant. Uh, it, it discharges its waste, well, it discharges its cleaned effluent into Cayuga Lake, okay, right here. Uh, and it treats about six to seven million gallons of water per day. And I, I would ask again, why did we put the treatment plant down here? We'll, we'll have the same answer, which is that that's the bottom of the landscape, that's where the water's all draining to, so you know, you, you want to put your water supply as high as possible and your wastewater treatment as low as possible. Did you have a question? No. no. Oh, the, you said the outfall was right there where your mouse is? Or is oh, it farther no. out? Oh, it's, no. It's, it's out here a bit. Oh, okay. It's not way out there, though. Really? I, I forgot exactly where. I think it might go out to the end of the pier. Um, so not in the inlet. I don't think it goes into the inlet. Good question. No, yeah, because the there's a little um, tower there that says your DEC per your speedies permit. At, at, at the end of the pier. Yeah, I thought it was in the end. Well, yeah. anyway, it's close by. <laughs> um, okay, we'll go through. I don't want to dwell too much on the schematics here, but you um, have the waste, basic wastewater schematic, and you can fill it in. Now that you know what the boxes and triangles mean, you get a sense of what's happening. Uh, and this time we actually have some pictures. So the first thing that's going to happen when it comes into the wastewater treatment plant is it's going to go, and again, you're going to take some of the solids out. So some of the solids in waste are already heavy, heavy enough. If you just give them a little bit of time, they will settle down to the bottom. We don't need to worry about what they are. Um, but you can imagine. Uh, and that settles down to the bottom, some of that waste, and you can remove it. And it, so this is primary. It's just, we'll call it primary settling. There's some other things. It's also called clarification. Um, this is basically what the tank looks like. Google is a little slow. Um, so you can see, you don't want to stir the water up too much. You want to kind of leave it alone, let things settle. And that, and that separates. That's your first level of separation. Okay. The next thing that we, is hard to tell because I just draw a rectangle here. But this is called, we'll call it activated sludge. Um, so essentially what's happening is you've got a bunch of bacteria, good bacteria really, um, which are also associated with the waste that comes into the plant. And they're just having a really big meal. Uh, you can almost imagine if bacteria were fish, this is basically feeding your fish tank. Um, and you put a bunch of flakes in and that looks, you know, you can imagine that that's waste and the bacteria just love to eat that stuff. And Essentially what you're doing is you're converting, you're converting nutrients, you know, waste material, into bacteria because the bacteria are growing off of that. And when the bacteria grow off of that, they form little colonies and they essentially get heavy and they start to act like a heavy solid. And then they start to settle out as well. Okay. So we, we won't show more parts of the plant, but you can see, for example, here, the arrow coming in from the bottom might be something like oxygen, because you've got to keep the bugs happy. They need oxygen to live, just like we do. Not all of them. Um, that gets complicated. That's a whole course. Um, and you, you want to actually keep some of, that, some of those biosolids in the plant, because it's actually good bacteria. You want them to grow and thrive. And so you have a bit of a recycle loop, and that's what that, that arrow going around is for. Okay. And then there's probably some form of disinfection, just like you might have uh, up in the water treatment part, there might be more specialized treatment removal for things like, like nitrate or phosphorus, things like that. And then it'll go off into your stream or aquifer, in this case, Kiva Lake. So here you can see the activated sludge tank, lots of bubbles because we're feeding in air or oxygen. I think they use air down at, um, in the Ithaca plant. So that gives you a sense of what it really looks like. Brian? Yes. So I don't know if this will get talked about later at all, but what's what's like secondary versus like yeah, tertiary? Yeah, that's what I was going to Tertiary is, so secondary is essentially activated sludge. Okay. 
primary is when you just do the first, you just let it settle, basically. Um, this is secondary. Tertiary is if you throw on another step. Maybe it could be anaerobic, something or other. It could be a, a nitrogen removal, something a little bit more specialized. Yes. For the primary settling, like you said, that they don't want to obviously disturb the water. Right. Um, so do they just like have a holding tank and then they like take in batches of water and let it sit and then just like move it on, or are they continuously feeding water in? There's all sorts of configurations, but I'd say the most common would be either. Let me. Now, I guess these are old clarifiers that they don't use anymore. The most common one would be either these long tanks where they feed it in on one end and they just slowly let it, they, they continuously feed it in but at a very low rate. Or the other way of doing it is sort of feeding it in through the center of a circle and then letting that like slowly flow outward. And then it, it goes over some, some ledges and it falls. So those are the two, two basic ways. So if you ever see circles, big circles or long rectangles, that's probably what's happening. So there's six million gallons a day coming into that tank. It sits there, and so it has to be out of there the next day for the next six million gallons, unless the tank's really big. Yeah, oh, it, it's all continuously moving all the time. So you, you do sometimes have what's called a sequencing batch reactor, for example, where you might fill up one thing, and then, then it sits maybe for a little while, and then you decant. Um, but a, a lot of plants are this sort of continuous flow design, where it would come, it would come through. And then really, like, the size of your pipes and the size of the tank is what dictates how right. fast you can move things through. Right. And your biology, like if your bugs start to get unhappy, things don't work right. So. Yeah, and I was going to say, even though um, Cornell is only kind of withdrawing um, 1.3 million gallons a day, right, and treating mm -hmm. it out of water, but the, so they have their own water treatment plant, but they're sharing the... Just give it ahead. Oh. <laughs> 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 okay, sorry. In case Great point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anyway, if you, if you look on, on Blackboard, there's a, a series of YouTube videos from one of the operators of the plant who actually describes exactly how this, this treatment facility works. He does a great job, so if you want to go access those videos, they're short and he keeps it light and stuff like that. So it's good. I would, I would recommend checking it out. Uh, okay. Moving on. Primary settling. We got it. Activated sludge, done. Right, let's just take a look at the pumps. Just to give you a real quick sense, you know, so when we talk about infrastructure, like sure, there's this stuff that you can see, um, but there's almost always a thing you can't see. And that's one of the things about water infrastructure that's not necessarily the case with things like roads and bridges where you, you, you can always visualize what's going on. So below this whole facility is essentially this underground network of pumps because you've got to keep the water moving when you're in the plant. Sure, it gets there by gravity, but once it's there, you've got to move it around. Um, and all these pumps are expensive and things can go wrong. They take maintenance uh, and somebody's got to pay for all that. And that's us, usually. Okay. So next question, why is the, why is the MGDs going, being treated by the treatment plant so much higher than what Cornell is actually taking out of Fall Creek. Okay, and, right. So the answer really is that because this sewage treatment plant is taking in a lot more wastewater than just what comes from Cornell. So there's multiple systems that feed into that facility. Uh, For example, the city of Ithaca. So if you live down, how many people live downtown? All right. You drink water from Six Mile Creek. Okay, and the facility is here. So here you can see, you can see Six Mile Creek. All right, there's a little, a bit of a reservoir looking thing there uh, where they're taking their water from. They have a, sim a similar facility to Cornell. Uh, Six Mile Creek is 46 square miles in terms of its watershed, so it's much smaller. Um, serves about 30,000 people, the, the population of Ithaca when there's no students here, essentially. Uh, and it takes about 2.6 million gallons per day out of Six Mile Creek, but it only delivers about 1.6 million gallons to the people of Ithaca. And that's because it actually loses a million gallons a day through its distribution and piping networks. 
So they treat the water, they take it out of Six Mile Creek, they treat it, and before it gets to your house, a million gallons every single day goes somewhere. So you, what you can imagine is that the pipes underneath the city are, are very old. Some of them may be new, but a lot of them are very old. Sometimes they're even made out of wood. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody has any wood distribution pipes anymore, but they would have had in the past. Uh, and you get leaks, and that's, that's where all the water goes. Okay, so I'll try and move it along. Okay, any questions on, on any of this stuff so far? Yeah. I'm curious about the bars inside the wastewater. What is this pump? So the pumps in the plant are really for, I'm trying to think exactly where, these ones were probably taken underneath the activated sludge basin. So these might be aeration pumps, actually feeding the air into the activated sludge tank. Um, and they'll be running essentially continuously. So all those bubbles that you saw require pumps like that to move them in. Uh, okay. But you may also get the, you may also have pumps like this if you need to if you're not using gravity always at your plant. Particularly when the when the water first comes in, you usually pump the water up to the top of the plant. Um, much the same way as Cornell will pump the water to the top of the hill. They'll do that same thing within the plant itself. And that'll require big pumps. Because I ever heard that uh, Cornell also take the water from the Cayuga Lake to make a pool or something at Cornell? Right. <laughs> and we're probably not going to talk about that, but. Um, oh, there it goes. Um, well, here. I'll skip, I'll skip ahead a little bit because what you're seeing right here is actually uh, another wastewater treatment plant in this, in this same very small area. This is used by uh, Cayuga Heights. So if you live up in Cayuga Heights, um, this is where your wastewater goes. But if you go just right in this nondescript, unadvertised building that Cornell maintains, uh, this is the Cornell Lake Source Cooling Building right here. If you look, if you go inside this building, it's basically a bunch of really enormous pumps uh, and heat exchangers. So what they're doing is they're taking the water out of the lower portion of, I draw really fast, here's the lake that's engineering for surface. Um, <laughs> right? And uh, Cornell will take the, the water out of the, out of the bottom of the lake, which is really cold, and they'll pump it up. Well, not necessarily, they don't necessarily pump the water up, but they get a heat exchange loop going to cool off Cornell buildings, especially during the summertime, um, but all year round, really. And they pump it back up. They pump it back into the lake closer to the surface than it was, where the water is naturally a, a higher temperature. So, and that building, that white building right there, has all the pumps needed to keep this loop going. So. But yeah, that's just another another thing that's thrown in, into the system that we, we're not going to really cover today, other than that. So really fast, Bolton Point also is an, is an additional water supply. They get their water from Cayuga Lake. Uh, so if you remember, Ithaca Wastewater Treatment Plant discharges its waste into Cayuga Lake. Bolton Point takes its water out of Cayuga Lake. It's happening all the time, everywhere. No water is pure, unless you're like on the very top of a mountain somewhere. Otherwise, it's been used by something or somebody. Okay, and we'll just, again, we'll finish off here with the Cayuga Heights wastewater treatment plant. The whole idea being that there's a lot of stuff going on, even right here in Ithaca. Multiple facilities, things you maybe didn't know that they, what they were, um, all happening all at the same time. So again, you know, it's a bit of a complicated system. You've got these different municipalities. Uh, the one thing I was going to say about the Bolton Point treatment facility is they actually serve five different municipalities, each of which could charge their own rates if they want to. So you may be getting the same water from the same place, paying something different. I'm not saying that they all charge different rates, but they, they could. Some of them do. Um, OK, so this is just the Ithaca area. Uh, 
one of the things I wanted to do was now focus on, on a, a particular watershed. So if we look, if we go back to where Cornell got its water from, from Fall Creek, and we, if you remember, there was about 125 square miles. So it's not this entire area, but, well, I drew a really bad picture of what the Fall Creek watershed is. And it looks kind of like this. Afterwards, I realized it looked like Great Britain. Um, <laughs> but this is, this is basically what it looks like. So if you, all the water that Cornell takes out of Fall Creek, anything that, if rain falls in, in any of this polygon, it all makes its way into Fall Creek and eventually flows past campus here. So that's, that's the concept of a watershed. And essentially, very basic idea I want to get across is that anything that happens within this polygon can impact the water quality and water quantity that we see when it goes right by campus here. So everything that happens inside this polygon is important for this watershed. Uh, it doesn't mean including groundwater as well? Uh, groundwater doesn't always follow the exact area of the surface water like this, but it's usually pretty close. Some geology and EPE folks. Um, I took Todd's class. <laughs> I remember him saying that. So that's what, that's what Todd Walter said. <laughs> um, okay. And then just to kind of drive that point home in terms of things happening inside this polygon that might also impact water quality is upstream of Cornell you've also got two other sewage treatment facilities that discharge into Fall Creek and it, you can see them here that's the Freeville facility and the Dryden facility and you'll see if I use the word POTW it means publicly owned treatment works you can just think of it as like a sewage plant or there's like 10 different acronyms they all mean the same thing we'll try and stick with POTW uh, but if you, if you see something that you don't know just ask and we'll, we'll clarify Okay, and so again, this is another example of sewage treatment facilities discharging upstream of somebody else who's actually taking water for their water supply, like Cornell. This is not necessarily a bad thing. It's happening all the time everywhere. It just means you need to be careful. You obviously wouldn't want to have those two pipes like right next to each other. That could be, you know, you just, you'd want to put some safety, safety factors in there. But uh, this does happen quite a bit. Okay, and again, this is just to illustrate how different water quality issues can be linked. You have water, wastewater treatment linked with water supply and vice versa uh, throughout the watershed. The other thing I wanted to point out here is you can see, um, you know, these are county, county borders. So a watershed doesn't really pay attention to where, you know, whose land it, it, it is. You can imagine that, you know, if this was an international border, for example, that there might be policy issues about whose water that is, uh, if, if somebody was really careful about water quality and the other jurisdiction was not very careful about it, you, you may see conflict in, in situations like that. Luckily, that doesn't happen so much with our water supply. Um, you know, if anything, you might have sort of a rural-urban divide in terms of how to manage things. But, uh, you know, so the watershed will cross boundaries, and there'll be more, more about that over the course of the class in terms of what types of issues can arise there. Uh, we are going to switch around like local TV news anchors. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Brian got most of the exciting for map stuff. I don't have that. <laughs> uh, so let's say you were in somewhere that was not Nithika, but somewhere nearby, you know, out of the city reach, uh, maybe a rural area, say Lansing. I mean, it's not too rural. It's not too far out, but it's a little bit far. That uh, the city or the local municipalities don't want to spend enough resources or money to put out sewer line, put out water supply line. So then what do you use right, for your water supply or wastewater? You, you rely on more decentralized systems, so you would uh, use a, a, a well that's on your property for drinking water. You will also use a septic system, let's say. And uh, that is a schematic uh, on the schematic sheet you have at the bottom you have a septic system which is again very similar to a wastewater treatment system in fact it's usually the other way the septic system uses natural soils so wastewater treatment systems are designed to mimic those natural soil properties so you have 
let's say, uh, in, a, in a basic septic system, you have a house, you have an outlet, it goes into a tank, which is called the septic tank. That's why the name septic systems. And then it could either be discharged immediately onto the soil somewhere, like subsurface discharge, or you could have some kind of a basic treatment, uh, a disinfection, and then a, a dispersal. You can do it on the ground. You can do, you know, construct systems, artificially engineered systems that mimic soil properties. So you could have a few iterations on that. But the concept, again, being everything is derived from and discharged into the same property. Uh, and, and here we are talking about mostly groundwater, so this is not surface water. So you have here issues that uh, involve planning and designing, so you have to have your groundwater uh, in, a, in such a way that you're not mixing your wastewater and drinking water supply. But then you could do that on your property, but then it's also likely that your wastewater could then be discharging into somebody else's water supply, so your neighbors or the community, you know, it could just, if it's not designed well, so let's say you have a treatment system that is not uh, either designed well or designed for fewer people and then now more people are living. So because of the fact that these are not centrally designed, centrally monitored, uh, you could have issues of uh, maintenance, you know, who, who does the maintenance? So the homeowners are responsible and nobody can always keep an eye on them. So. There you get into issues of public safety, public health, where you know the, the county or the city or the town would have some rules and then it would have to make sure somebody's following them. Enforcement of the rules, so you're now getting into you know, issues of uh, you know, beyond just basic hydrology or you know, science. So now you get into non-science stuff. Um, and, and that's kind of critical when you're talking about issues like that. And you want to okay. switch back? And then we start to keep doing this a little bit before we run out of time. Yeah. Sorry for all the switching, but. So we'll switch to a really, to a totally different topic in some ways. And I think it's going to be covered much better by multiple speakers later on. So I'm only going to go through it quickly so as to, it, again, impress upon people maybe how big of an issue that it is. Um, and, and why it is an important component of, of infrastructure. So I'll be talking about you know, essentially what happens when it rains. So stormwater management is really a critical component to infrastructure. A lot of municipalities, so for example, uh, Ithaca has a whole separate sewer system for sanitary sewage, which is basically what goes down the toilet or you know, when you're done with your shower. All that goes through one set of pipes. But when when it rains out, that all falls into a totally separate set of pipes. And it gets managed differently. It goes to a different place. It does not go to the sewage treatment plant um, because you can imagine that the volume of water that might fall in like a really heavy rainstorm in the summertime especially um, is, is really so much water compared to just, you know, even if everybody in town flushed the toilets at the same time, like first commercial of the Super Bowl, um, you know, it still wouldn't be even close to, to a major storm event. So towns that can separate those two flows can manage them differently, and that really is an advantage. A lot of cities don't manage those flows differently. They, they all go, it all goes to the same pipe, and that's what's called a combined sewer. Again, Ithaca has a separate sewer. If you put it all in the same pipe, it's a combined sewer. One of the biggest issues going, especially in the Northeast, where you have these older industrial cities, uh, is a combined sewer overflow, which essentially means that when, it's, when it rains, there's so much fluid in the system, so much water and waste of all kinds off the street, from your toilet, from your shower, everything, that that wastewater treatment plant can't handle it, and it essentially just lets it go. Sometimes it treats it a little bit, or it holds it a little bit, and sometimes it just essentially overflows. Um, there's, a, there's a spectrum in there, for sure. So. Combined, over, combined sewer overflows are a big issue. That's why you don't swim after it rains. Um, in some areas, just saying. If, if, if you live in some place where there's a CSO, don't go swimming right after it rains. Talk, about more, talk more about that later. Um, how does Ithaca deal with some of its stormwater? Uh, it, it's a bit difficult to see using maps, but I, I picked this just to again, give us a sense of the scale of the, of the issue and how much engineering and money can go into some of these things. So what you're looking at here is, this is the inlet, okay? 
Um, and it'll flow by, this is Wegmans, if you've been down there, and this is some, it's not really in, necessarily industrial, but some sort of uh, commercial and industrial space down by the inlet. Uh, and this is what's going to flow out uh, past Island Fitness and Cass Park and things like that. You can see it's a straight channel. So that was, that's engineered. I mean, somebody had to build that channel, and that costs a lot of money. But it actually comes from a natural stream. So down here, you can start to see the natural stream that is the inlet, essentially. You can see some sandbanks and a meandering stream that that's what it used to do before we turned it into this straight thing. Okay? And the reason why we turned it into this straight thing was so that we could actually control the volume of water going by and prevent flooding, even though we don't always do that successfully. Uh, but if you want to try and control flooding, this is one way of doing it. And again, it's a major earthwork. It takes a lot of money. Um, and at some point, it probably took a lot of political will to make that happen, I'm sure. Probably a long time ago. Uh, so any questions on that? We have some examples of green infrastructure, but I'm not going to show them. Could you talk a little bit more about the flood control with the inlet and specific measures that they take? Yeah, well, you know, a couple things is right here, you've got a, you've got a lock, essentially. And so you, you can control the, the levels, the flow, to some degree, going into the inlet. So if you felt like you wanted to kind of hold back that water a little bit and maybe, you know, bide your time, you know, and, and let the, maybe for the rainstorm to pass and those types of things, you can actually, you can control the levels a little bit. Cayuga Lake is controlled also at the top of the lake. They have some, uh, what would you call them? Essentially, they're not really locks, but uh, something where you can actually control the level of the lake, and you can you can let it build up or you can draw it down if you want to build in some buffer where you want to absorb some storm events and things like that. So, and the other thing too is that they have to be dredged. They're supposed to be dredged. Right. Right. Which they haven't been. That's yeah. A big controversy. You know. So the, the ability of the inlet to actually absorb storm water is dependent on on it being, you know, they'll probably design it like a pipe, essentially, with a certain diameter and a certain volume that it can hold. And if sediments drop to the bottom, uh, that, that pipe gets smaller and smaller, which is why you need to essentially dredge, because you, know, you want it. It was designed to do a certain thing that it's slowly not being able to do. Uh, now, they don't really dredge the inlet, but they're talking about it. I'm sure they have, they have in the past. I oh, yeah, they, but they haven't for their years, but they're going to in the next yeah. year or two. It's always a big debate, though, like dredging, because it'll kick up all the sediments, and then where do you put all the solids? That's actually really, really expensive also. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and now they have my drill. I'll, I'll show the picture just because it's cool. Um, some other cool ways of dealing with storm water that are maybe more fun and more appealing to people in the class. Uh, if you go to some place like Syracuse, they're doing a lot with their storm water. They're not building big, big channels necessarily. That, that's probably what they used to do. Now they're trying to do some other stuff like put green roofs on some of their major buildings. And the whole idea there is that if the picture ever shows up, it's not going to show up, is it? Yeah, oh, really? Huh. OK, well, that picture didn't show up. Um, what building is that? This is the On Center, so it's their convention center. It's right downtown. And right now, we, there was a picture where, that we took last summer. This whole rooftop is all green, essentially planted uh, a variety of different plants on, on top of the roof. And the idea being to absorb some of that storm water so that it doesn't just run off into the sewers and immediately make its way to, to the lake or to, you know, to overwhelm some of those other engineering works that might be downstream there. So, and more people will definitely be covering this, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. We'll get Todd to talk about it. <coughs> okay, so now we'll move on to some of the other issues. For example, how do you pay for all these things? Because uh, everything, almost everything we just talked about takes really enormous amounts of money. It's what, maybe the, the second largest budget item on almost any municipality's budget. So. Is it what roads is first? Roads, I think. Roads and then water. Highways or something. So it's like second yeah. or third. So it's always one of the most expensive things that you are paying for when you pay taxes. Is this stuff? I'm sure you'll talk more about it. How do we switch to the okay. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, 
I'm not immediately going to talk about it. But uh, actually, I did remember you talked about flushing toilets at the same time. There yeah. was a town or city in England that recently tried to do that because they had so much fat accumulated in their pipes that they requested all their citizens to flush it the same. I don't know. It actually was successful, but they, they tried doing that. <laughs> so so there is, there is uh, some meaning in that. Uh, okay, so how do we pay for this? So, so there, this is where you start to move from science and engineering to looking at you know, policy stuff, how the public reacts to it, what kind of issues come up, and you know, different communities acting against each other, uh, sometimes harming their own self-interest, uh, in fact, a lot of times. Uh, so the predominant ways we fund this is taxes and fees. So th those are two basic ways. And, and there are differences in what counts as a tax and what actually counts as a fee. Uh, although when a lot of people talk about it, there is some uh, intermixing of you know terms. And it's not well explained, but there are specific differences in how they are counted. And, and different governments at all levels, they, they try to fund some of this. Uh, the federal government does some, the state governments do, the local governments do. And when, when I say government, it's all of us. So you know, when we pay taxes, we fund some of that. We pay fee in some cases, the, you, know, you use a certain thing, and then you pay proportionally for that. So, that's, uh, so everybody is pitching in. The reason being that the public health implications are just too enormous to not do that. So if you were to say, assume Ithaca wastewater treatment plant not functioning for like five days. So six, seven MGD times five. So you have 30 million gallons of waste, untreated waste, just all getting into the lake. Really. So, so the, the, the implications of you know, talking about swimming, and so if you are in contact with that water, you could get affected. And that could be taken up by boiling point. So that sort of gets moves. You know, that same waste stream moves along. So it could, it could have a much bigger implication uh, just due to this failure at one, one point. So because of that, every, at every level, the government sort of steps in. They have programs. They have funds dedicated. But uh, it's probably not, not enough in, in, in terms of meeting the demands that we have. Uh, and, and when I talk about taxes, I also mentioned there is something called fees. So if you have users paying a certain fee, so depending on the quantity consumed. So if you have, so this is an example of the city of Ithaca uh, water bill, courtesy Brian. So uh, you have, uh, I was just going to point out maybe this one thing. So there are a lot of details in there, and there's a lot of details that are not in there. So it's, it's actually fairly simplistic. It gives, a, it gives a meter reading here. So 117 was the, his, the previous one, previous reading. 124 is the current. So the difference of that is seven units. And one unit is uh, typically 100 cubic feet. It's about 750 gallons. It's so an odd, odd way of measuring. Uh, so, so that's why it says seven. Now it says seven hundred. So there it says seven, seven hundred. So it's basically seven hundred cubic feet for for three months, and there is a certain amount that is set. And that amount again consists of a fixed fee and a variable fee. So you have a fixed fee because you need to make sure that the city is able to cover the cost of maintaining the pipes, fixing those pumps, supplying disinfection. You know, those those are all sort of fixed costs that that have to be there in, in some way. And then the variable cost is now based on how much you consume. So if you consume seven units or 700 units, there is a certain cost. If you do 800, it's going to go up. And, and that's just to make sure that people who consume more are also paying somewhat proportionally more. Uh, the sewer bill, if you, if you notice, the units consumed is the same. And that's not because they were measuring both water and sewer, but that's just an assumption that they made that the sewer is going to be the same as water. Um, and and that, that works out well if you have, uh, if it's all indoor consumption. Because all the water that's coming in is also going to go out in some form, you know, maybe a delay, you, you store the water for some time, but then ultimately that goes up. But if you have a lawn, then you're actually not consuming anything. And, or, or maybe you are consuming, if you let's say you're sprinkling your lawn, you know, if you're irrigating your lawn. So you are consuming that, but then it's not going into the waste stream. It's just getting absorbed or it's just, you know, getting into, you know, uh, a channel that's nearby, but it's not getting into the wastewater stream, but you're still getting built for it. So there are, there are issues with that. And there are a lot of studies that you know deal with how do we make sure that the rates are reflective of the, the water supply and the, you know, the demand in a certain season, especially in summer, this becomes critical. So there are studies that look at how do we make sure that people are optimizing their use and how are we talking about, you know, how, how do we make sure that uh, 
people are responding to the prices and, and people are responding to needs. So there'll be these emergency measures when they'll say, oh, no, no watering the lawns on like odd days or no showering, you know, during the even days, something, something odd. Uh, Can I ask you a quick question about that? Yes, and, yes. And, and, so, am I saying that number right at the bottom? Is that nine fifty six per hundred cubic feet? Nine dollars fifty six cents on the very bottom line. Mm -hmm. I can't see it. Okay. Uh, this one, yes. Yeah. Okay. And yes. So that cost does that take into account that half the water's disappeared? So basically, it has been treated but disappeared. So they have to actually account for. I mean, not every city is losing fifty percent of their water, right? I mean, no. That, no. Out west, that would be a phenomenal loss. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so the, the rates are again variable across cities, towns. So, city of Ithaca might charge differently than, say, um, town of Ithaca, Golden Point. You know, they all might have different rates. And precisely, some of some of these differences are going to be narrow in Ithaca. But then, once you go statewide uh, or even you know nationally, then you you have differences in how, uh, say, a city in Arizona might be looking at its wastewater or water consumption compared to how. Ithaca or Rochester. Right? What is right, it? But is it Ithaca would, because they know, so from Hope Point, they know how much water they're delivering, and then they know how much water is being consumed because they're metered. Right. So they know what the loss is, and then they add that on. Right, so the losses are covered by, so the losses are spread out. So yeah. that's why right. it's key to make sure they're, you're, that they call it non revenue water. So that's sort of brought down. The typical industry standard across the world is about 15%. So City of Ithaca losing yeah. like you know, one, you know, two thirds of something is, is like pretty, pretty high. Um, wow. So, uh, so, so, and, and the variation also reflects some of the changes in terms of the infrastructure, uh, you know, preparedness. So, older cities have, you know, say older pipes, so that requires a lot of maintenance. Some of the cities have losing populations, so that also adds into the mix because now you're uh, having all these old pipes. So, so, Detroit is a classic example. They have a big city, they have a lot of infrastructure, but the core of the city has declined so much that there are only about 700,000 people where there used to be about two and a half million or three million people. So you have the infrastructure that's built for those people. It has to be maintained in some way, but you have only a fewer people, like one third of that. So the costs are now you know, disproportionately shared by all of those people. So that's, that's an issue. Uh, the utilities can set their own rates. So nobody, you know, no state government or federal government sets a standard. So utilities set their own rates. Uh, most utilities in the U.S. are public. So they are controlled by the local municipality. It's either an appointed board or it's in some kind of elected board in some cases. If it's appointed, it's running under the mayor or the city manager's control. So you, you can expect some politics out there because of the fact that it is publicly accountable to you know the, the local residents. On the minimal side, you also have some private utilities. So you, you have some communities that figure out at some point that they are not able to do this uh, in a way that you know would be more optimal with you know their own resources, so they have privatized that uh, service. And there you have some oversight. So there in in New York State, you have the Public Service Commission that has to approve those rate changes. So anytime the private utility says we need to hike up the rates because something happened, the cost of chemicals has gone up, the maintenance costs have gone up. You know, some reason they have to explain, and you know they they get it. So, so there is a public oversight at some level uh, at how these rates are set, and and this this can get a little bit tricky because people don't want. Obviously, nobody wants to pay, uh, you know, more for their water. But then, it's it's still pretty cheap. I mean, six dollars for about two months of showering. I mean, it's, it's pretty cheap. Yeah. Um, you also have uh, most. Um, cities or uh, water districts issue something called a drinking water report, water quality report. And this is required by law. So they have to issue this every year. And this uh, talks about some basic uh, chemical tests that they have done over the years. Uh, and they'll report like the averages and, and also if there are any, any abnormalities you know, during the testing that they found and remedial measures that they have taken. So this is some kind of a report that the city basically issues to its residents saying that you're the water you're drinking is safe. Um, and, and it has a bunch of other information. A lot of cities don't, I mean, don't spend so much resources in actually putting out all this information. They, they just do the bare minimal. But Ithaca does a little more than that. You also have some, you know, what were the projects completed. It's essentially a newsletter from the city of Ithaca to its residents talking about what we have done, what we are doing. It talks about future projects and capital improvements, what kind of projects we are going to do, how much it would cost, what's the time span of that, what it would do, what's the benefit of doing that. So, so things uh, 
like that. It, it also lists, uh, uh, I think it lists costs of the projects only on the water supply. So this is just water supply. It does not include wastewater. Uh, we are getting close to our time. So I think we will sort of move along to the next uh, uh, next topic. And that is some, some broader implications of just uh, water issues and how it all started maybe. And do you have any sense of like legislatively What's sort of the focal point of you know all the water issues that we're talking about at the U.S. national level? Any sort of major legislation that did anything about water issues that sort of revolutionized that way of thinking? Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act. That's that's pretty. Uh, that's that's actually uh, the way I put it. Maybe it, it is the right answer. So Clean Water Act, 1972. Uh, but uh, that that was not the first attempt, and it is it is not the last attempt. Definitely. Uh, so, uh, do you also remember the president who signed the bill? Nixon. Partially mm -hmm. true. He actually did not sign the bill. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so Clean Water Act again, and again, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, unofficial moniker. Clean Water Act is not the official name of the law. Uh, so, this actually came, so I'm just going to run through a brief, just to tell you that Clean Water Act is not the starting point. There were a lot of uh, initiatives before that began. So one of them was called the Rivers and Harbors Appropriations Act. Obviously, around this time, 1899, navigation was a big issue. Shipping was a big industry. So there was an issue of what happens to the waste in the sea, in, in you know, the sea co coastlines, and, and what are the ships doing. So, the, so this law was uh, meant to sort of curtail pollution coming from these big containers and barges and things like that. Uh, obviously, it was not very successful. Uh, there were a lot of issues. The federal government at that point, and as it continues even now, to think that states should be given the rights to control water pollution. So they came up with the Federal Water Pollution Control Act in 1948. And that also went through the same process. So it, it gave a lot of uh, authority to the states. And, uh, and, and the, the key difference that came, actually, they went through a bunch of revisions. Uh, they had six revisions in the 20 years. So you know they kept the same name, basically, but then kept uh, renewing the act and adding amendments and you know making some changes, cosmetic changes. But finally, what what actually happened was uh, I mean you probably know about the fire in yeah. Cuyahoga River and all that. So maybe I'll not go through that. Uh, but the the key uh, difference between this act that happened in 1972. Yeah, the river caught on fire. Okay, I'm not a yeah. The river caught on fire. Okay, in Ohio. Which uh, which <laughs> had happened before several times, but this time somebody snapped a photo. That's all. <laughs> so there was a reporter who actually took a photo, and then so that basically became a big news, uh, uh, and and uh, and that prompted a lot of the uh, legislators to get together and start working on this. And uh, the the key difference between that seventy two act and the the previous uh, you know re the revisions that happened was that it it changed the enforcement standard. So before uh, nineteen seventy two, the enforcement standard was on the on the stream itself. So ev every law basically said that we have to make sure that, say, the Chesapeake Bay or the Cayuga Lake has to have a certain, has to meet a certain standard. But then this act flipped it. It said anybody who is discharging the water has to make sure that they are discharging it at a certain rate. So if you are an industry, if you are a wastewater treatment plant, then the outlet at your end would be measured and that has to meet a certain standard. So that, you know, sort of changed the way we think about uh, water pollution. It also removed or neglected the non-point sources, which we call non-point sources, basically, which you cannot measure. They're diffuse, so you have waste coming from septic systems, waste coming from agriculture, you know, anywhere else that's not a, a point that you can actually you know, really pinpoint, like this is the source. Uh, those were excluded, and, and that was highly political, again, to make sure that there was enough support from the agricultural states and you know, things like that. Uh, Nixon, President Nixon was initially in support of the law, but when he saw the figure, when the cost was put on the bill, he said, you know, he's not going to sign. So he actually vetoed it, and then it went back to the House and Senate, they overturned the veto. So that's that's where Nixon did not sign the bill. Um, so the, that's the name of the law, Federal Water Pollution Control Amendments of 1972. And since then, there have been some revisions. Uh, it has uh, also been legislatively fought. Supreme Court has ruled several times of on what actually means. So the text of the law is like uh, pollution should be eliminated from the navigable waters of the U.S. So what is navigable? What is waters of the U.S.? All those are contested terms even now, uh, and and like you know it, it's 
it's always something that uh, basically gets people we are pretty close to our time. So yeah. I'm not sure we'll get through the, the whole lecture uh, that we prepared. Let me just, I'll just mention one or two more things before we, before we close here. Uh, we're not going to talk about this, but there is a paper on the website. If you're really interested in this, you can look at it. Um, otherwise, you know, it, it basically says, what if, the same way Shri just talked about changing from looking at the water body itself to looking at the actual discharge point as the point of pollution, we try to look at, instead of a single, we almost went back the other way. We actually said, well, what if we look at our infrastructure as all coming from this watershed? So these are different watersheds in New York, very large scale watersheds. This down here is New York City. Um, and that's something that we have up on Blackboard. Probably, probably just going to skip that for now. Um, let's see here. But just wanted to end briefly with the idea of, you know, why were we having, what got us interested in this work at all? What were our motivations? And just some things that we were talking about over the last hour or so. This stuff is very expensive. So in New York alone, we're talking about $36 billion to repair and replace our water related, or actually, it's, that's for wastewater only. So wastewater related infrastructure just over the next 20 years. That doesn't even include water infrastructure. And we already know, you know those two things are really connected to each other. Um, you know, those are estimates and they'll change, but it's a lot of money. Uh, federal funding through the Clean Water Act, which isn't called that, um, has been reduced by 70% over the last couple decades. So I mean, there used to be a lot of money that came in from the, from the federal government to assist in these types of projects. Uh, redoing Ithaca sewer, for example, we'd be able to get a, a, large, a large federal grant for that. Now they're really loans, or they're state-level loans. Um, so that's, that's happening while all these uh, repair needs are also coming online at the same time. And a, a recent assessment done by the New York State De uh, Department of Environmental Conservation, that's the DEC, sort of New York's regulatory environmental uh, agency, showed that in the last 30 years, 24% of the declines in stream water quality were due, at least in part, to organic waste and or municipal and industrial inputs. So, you know, if we look maybe back 80, 70 to 80 years ago, certainly there have been large improvements to water, water quality and in, in, in our infrastructure since, since those times. But in the last couple of decades, uh, things haven't been moving forward quite so much, and maybe we're now even seeing a little bit of a, of a decline in some of our water quality, um, or we're, we're really plateauing. So uh, seems to be, why now? This stuff costs a lot of money. States are getting less and less assistance from the federal government, um, and it really does impact water quality in a lot of different ways. And so that's why we're really looking at it, and we're trying to bring in all these different perspectives. Uh, and I think maybe we'll just close with that. That's about time. If anybody has any final things they want to make sure we cover in other lectures or just a question about something we covered today? No? All right. So we'll be talking about bits and pieces of all these things uh, from different lecturers as the course goes on. We'll be here, not in 11.05, and uh, hopefully we'll see everybody next week. And if in the back corner there, you are enrolled and you want to sign. Are you enrolled? Yeah. Yeah, all right. <coughs>